Hello and welcome to In Conversation here on CNBC Africa. I'm Chris Bishop. Now, he was one of the biggest and best known names in British politics. And now he's on a campaign to save the noble lion from the cruelty of man in Africa. His name is Lord Ashcroft, the former chairman of the Conservative Party and at one time one of the hundred richest people in Britain. For a, over a year, he oversaw an undercover operation involving ex-Special Forces soldiers in Africa to gather evidence on the grim trade of so-called canned lion hunting. Now, that is the breeding and grooming of rangy, mighty lions for killing by hunters, basically in a pen. You could call it shooting fish in a barrel. Now, Lord Ashcroft has written a book about it, calling it Unfair Game. He's reported it to the authorities, and he joins me now to talk more about this trade from his adopted home in Belize in Central America. Thank you very much for joining us, indeed. Um, just to start off with, a lot of people, as you said, that don't really understand what this canned lion hunting is in Africa and how it operates and why people should object. Just give us a quick sketch uh, at the start of exactly why you took this up and what canned lion hunting is. Well, I first uh, set foot in uh, South Africa in 1948. Uh, on uh, my way with my parents for their first uh, posting in what was then Nyasaland, uh, now Malawi. And over the years, I've probably visited South Africa, uh, certainly every year and at times uh, twice a year. And one of the areas of enjoyment for me is going on a photographic type of safari in many of the countries in Africa. And a couple of years ago, I was uh, in the Kruger Park uh, with a group of uh, military guys who are suffering from uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome by pairing them with orphaned rhinos in order that they could see the stress that those rhinos were having as babies, having their mothers killed by poachers. And whilst I was there, I heard the story that there was a captive bred lion industry and that it was extremely cruel and that these lions were born to be killed either by their bones or by hunters in what you describe as uh, a pen. And um, I was curious. And so the first part of this was to go and have a look myself. And that included me hiring a helicopter with photographic lenses to fly over a number of these farms uh, to see the lions in their pens and to see whether there was a justification in the stories of this cruel and barbaric trade. And that's how it started. And uh, these particular lines, as uh, what I have found, is that the people, many people are unaware of what is going on. And many people are duped into supporting uh, this industry. For example, the petting of cubs. These cubs that are taken away from their mothers after two or three days get volunteers from around the world, kids in their gap year, to come to South Africa to look after these cubs. Uh, being told that they've either been abandoned by their mother uh, or have, um, or their mother has been shot by, uh, by poachers. And they pay to come for this petting of the cubs. And the tourists come uh, to do this. But what they don't see is behind the scenes, the slaughterhouses, uh, where the lionesses, when uh, the time is up for them, having bred many times, uh, they're then slaughtered and their bones are then extracted and sent to the Far East, uh, where they're used in so-called traditional medicinal purposes, to which no medical um, uh, expert has actually said that there is any particular merit in the medicines that are being hawked. And then the, as far as the, the uh, many of the males are concerned, they're advertised on the internet for so-called hunters to come to South Africa to spend a couple of days at one of these farms uh, where the lions are transported, drugged, and put into pens, and then released into a large area uh, to which the so-called hunter comes along uh, to shoot the lion. And these lions are basically uh, tame. They've been used to humans. They've been fed by humans. And quite often, the lions walk towards the hunters, so it's not a fair chase. And uh, then the hunter takes the body parts that it wants, mainly the head, for its trophy uh, to be able to show the world how macho uh, that he is. And there are about now estimated 12,000 captive bred lions in South Africa. 
against 3,000 uh, in the wild. And this cruelty uh, has continued and grown. There are some 200 farms now uh, in uh, South Africa. So part of the second investigation in which I sent in undercover operatives, I actually bought a lion. And uh, one of my special forces went through the paraphernalia of going to the farm and right to the point of shooting the lion, stopped at that particular point and didn't shoot the lion. But having bought the lion, we then rescued it and sent it to a center in uh, South Africa to spend the, the rest of its life. But we, we went through that process and the undercover team took photographs within the slaughterhouses showing these lions being skinned and boned uh, for this medicinal purposes in the, uh, in the Far East. So in a nutshell, that is what drove me the passion uh, to highlight what is going on in this industry in South Africa. So all of this trade though, um, you've got to accept that without a, a long, long line of very rich people prepared to come to Africa and put down hard currency, this, this trade wouldn't exist. Uh, what about um, doing something about the people as well as uh, trying to protect the animals? Well, it's a bit like uh, many other industries. It's like uh, drug smuggling into the United States from South, uh, South America. Uh, you always have two aspects to a business of supply and demand. Uh, you have the South Americans uh, doing the supply and the American population the demand. So those that support the supply say attack the demand and those that support the demand say attack the supply. Uh, but uh, part of, uh, uh, there will always be people. Uh, and for me, it, it takes a horrific person to pay money to have fun, uh, to shoot a majestic creature. But part of the campaign is to stop uh, the importation of body parts from South Africa because that is one of the motivators to these hunters, to be able to take the head or other body parts or to make jewelry um, out of the teeth and, or claws of the lion. The second part of the campaign uh, would be for South Africa to stop the export of uh, uh, bones uh, to the Far East. At the moment, uh, the law says that 800 skeletons a year can be exported from South Africa but it's quite clear from the investigation and in my book, Unfair Game, that the amount of bones that are exported and smuggled out of South Africa is significantly more than the 800. There is also in South Africa a recent law that has made the lion uh, the same category of animal as, as a farmyard animal. Uh, so that uh, the health care uh, is much reduced. And some of the photographs which we've got on my website, lordashcroftwildlife.com, shows the cramped and terrible conditions in which these lions are brought up because the farmers have no real interest in the welfare of the lion. They just want it to grow to a certain size in order to take the bones from it or for the lionesses at least to be in a decent state uh, to be able to continually breed. And there is no conservation value here for whatever anybody else says. And that's a load of nonsense. We'll get into uh, this those. Is, this is... This is confined to a few farms, a few people, a cash business. And the reverse of conservation is there. We've well, got evidence in the book of these people going into Botswana to kill wild lionesses in order to capture the cubs, to bring them back into South Africa to improve the gene pool. Now, we'll get into some of the, uh, these issues around uh, the whole issue of hunting here in this continent a bit later. But just firstly, just, just talk a little bit about this undercover operation that you had to do. It must have been quite dangerous at times and certainly quite difficult. Um, but the other thing I was going to say, um, for a person like yourself, a high profile, uh, a very uh, rich person like yourself, Coming into like another country where you don't bear the passport and carrying out like an undercover operation, no matter how altruistic it is, were you not afraid you may, may be criticised for doing this? I think in my, I've had a controversial career from, uh, from my early 20s and I'm 74 now. And I certainly don't intend to shy away from anything that's controversial. And I certainly believe that when there is something in whatever nation uh, is unacceptable, socially unacceptable, is cruel, uh, then I don't see why uh, being a citizen of that country should be the only qualification 
to have a look at it, to bring it to worldwide attention. And you do have people in South Africa, like Ian Mickler, who have tried for years uh, to be able to bring international weight and to do something in South Africa. And he'd be the first to say that he hasn't been able to reduce the amount of these farms and the, the corruption levels uh, from uh, local law enforcement and right the way to the top of the tree has been one of the reasons why this industry has been allowed to flourish. And again, uh, how, what were the difficulties? Uh, what, were, what were the, the times during this uh, one year undercover investigation where you thought maybe perhaps I've bitten off more than I can chew? Maybe it's, uh, it's going to be a lot more complicated than I thought. No, I think um, uh, trophy hunting per se is not an area that I get involved in. I'm only involved in one aspect of, the, of this hunting, and that's the captive bred lion industry where there is this canned hunting and the byproduct of the bones going to uh, China. So just that aspect, it's the non-fair chase uh, trophy hunting. Uh, that is the area of interest uh, to me. Now, as far as the investigation is concerned, there were two parts to it. One was my own personal trip, where, as I mentioned earlier, I chartered a helicopter and flew over these farms in order to see firsthand uh, for myself. The second part, uh, and I used special forces people to organize and arrange this, who had already reconnoitered uh, the farms. These farms are often in remote places, uh, uh, away from uh, uh, other uh, established towns or cities, and massively fenced, patrolled, and people are disencouraged from getting in. And when people do get in, they only see the front of house, which is the petting of lion cubs and the walking with lions, the two aspects uh, which attracts the, uh, the tourist money. As far as the second part of the investigation by my special forces, uh, this was to enlist uh, the cooperation of one farmer who himself uh, was involved in the trade and was prepared to help my people uh, in getting gruesome film. And again, if you have a look at my website, lordashcroftwildlife.com, you'll see two owners of one particular farm taking seven minutes to kill a lion with 10 shots whilst chatting to themselves and having a good laugh at what was happening. And sure. these are horrific. Sure. These are horrific scenes. And when you see some of the lions within their captive cages, mangy, uh, uh, the food often that they're given is stuff you wouldn't even... Uh, <laughs> give to your worst, uh, worst enemy. Now you and took all this. this the so, sorry, you took all this evidence to the authorities, and also you took it to the police. You say you've heard nothing from the South African authorities at the moment. I would venture that I don't think you're going to hear anything at all. Um, bearing in mind the government, we all get a chance to criticise them here in South Africa, but they've got their hands full with COVID nineteen as well. They're looking for ways to. Uh, and hard currency. Um, I don't. What are you going to do if you just hear nothing back? Well, part 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 of it is the the amount of foreign currency uh, within this industry is a very very small percentage of the GDP of South Africa. The the main uh, GDP contributions in South Africa, where wildlife is concerned, is the photographic uh, wildlife, the safaris. The lodges, the trips up the uh, up the Zambezi, uh, up the rivers. Uh, I can't remember the name of a couple of the boats that that that, that run there. Uh, the areas of Cape Town, Durban, um, the Zulu Wars of the 19th century, uh, so on and so forth. So, so this part of of foreign currency is very small indeed, and very little actually gets into the South African exchequer, as it is fundamentally cash business. And the vast amount of this cash stays abroad, never comes back into South Africa anyway. So I wouldn't sort of push hard on the economic argument. But as far as uh, South Africa being busy with COVID, yes, of course, that's there. 
But what is the, what is the, uh, the answer to that? Ah, dear, here is a cruel and barbaric sport because South Africa has got other things on its hands at the moment. Let's just forget about it. Let's put it on the back burner. Let's not worry about it. Let the trade continue. I don't think that's the answer either. But what can so people has to be, like you do about it? There has it. to be groups of... That's, that's the question well, I have. To be, yeah, well, I, I think to an extent, it's a combination between some international pressure. Uh, I've been trying in the United Kingdom, and I expect that it will happen, uh, that the importation of body parts uh, will be um, uh, will be banned, and that is often the the main one of the main motivators of people that do come to South Africa to kill a captive bred lion is to be able to have the trophies. So that part goes. I think there should be effort by the international community into CITES to move the lion up from Appendix Two to Appendix One, uh, so that um, uh, that can deal uh, with the bone side of the industry. And once the bone side goes, that's another lucrative part of the industry that could be cut. And, and you have at the moment uh, your Minister of Environment uh, with a so-called panel uh, looking at it, which will report later this year. I'm not optimistic. Many on that panel have uh, conflicts of interest and others who should be on that panel have refused to serve. And so long as there is heavy corruption uh, in this particular sector, it'll be slow going. But like many things in uh, in life, um, where, where if there isn't energy to attempt to do something, nothing happens anyway. So we'll move we'll move on, and I'll put more and more resource into it. Um, as I say, how far are you prepared to go uh, to achieve what, what you're talking about? As far as, as, as reasonably able to do so with like-minded people and like-minded uh, uh, organizations like Bloodlines and so on and so forth in order to give wider and wider um, uh, transparency, especially within South Africa. The book, the book has been selling well uh, in South Africa. Uh, my, my website has received many comments from people in South Africa, totally unaware uh, of what is going on. We need to get countries who send their kids to these farms to so-called look after lions to be told uh, that they are supporting a cruel industry. Uh, we need tourist companies within South Africa not to send people to these farms as part of their excursions because of what is going on in the trade. A lot to be done. But as you know, the hunters, they still say, well, the money we get from these things, it pays for conservation. It stops us burning down the bush to put cattle in. Uh, that's what they say. So it's self-sustaining. It's a load of bollocks. Uh, and any analysis will show that is. But remember, I'm only talking about the captive bred lion industry, not, uh, not trophy hunting per se of other animals or fair chase hunting. It is purely the cruelty and barbaric of this industry. And there is no evidence at all that there is any help for conservation within this aspect of the industry. Tell me something. Uh, this is uh, big in some ways. I know it's a small part of a bigger business, but still big money we're talking about. Are you had any threats at all from people? Have you had any, uh, any fear at all when you've been doing this uh, campaign? There's always um, undertones in this type of campaign, uh, but that's part, that is part for the course. I formed in the United Kingdom 25 years ago an organization called Crime Stoppers, uh, which is a, an anonymous information seeking uh, uh, knowledge on crime that leads to arrest and charge of people. And since I've been chairman of that, uh, there have been 150,000 arrests uh, on that side of the of uh, of Crime Stoppers. That again is a, is another area where there's always some underlying tones, and of course th there are. And what That's would you say? 
Then what would you say to the people out there? I mean, I've seen photographs. I saw some of the, the photographs in your book of people standing there, rifles, trophies, smiling over the body of uh, an animal. What would you say to these people? Look, I, I, I've said on social media is that I have utter contempt for every person who pays money to have fun to shoot a majestic animal. I have even more contempt for, for those who know they're about to shoot a tame lion in a massive enclosure for fun and pay money to do so, utter contempt. And part of that is the driving force behind having written this book, Unfair Game. So where does it go now? You've written a book, you're raising money, you're still campaigning to stop canine hunting, etc. What's the next step for you now, looking to the future? Well, I, I, would, I would expect at some point that, that I have to update uh, where we are uh, on this particular project. But I will certainly support those charities and people like Blood Lions and others in South Africa, <clears throat> which are trying to do something uh, about the banning uh, of this trade. So I shall financially assist uh, uh, fellow kindred spirits of, of this sector and even by doing these types of interviews uh, to be alerting people uh, to this terrible uh, scar uh, that, that uh, brand South Africa can ill afford to have as worldwide condemnation uh, comes onto the country. Just to talk a little bit more about the lions themselves, I mean, to nail my colours to the mast, I spent, as I said before the show, many years reporting in the bush, and I have heard the roar of a hungry lion in the wild. I can tell you it sends shivers down my spine to this day. I've always had respect for animals. Uh, I always steer clear of them. I would never harm an animal at all. Um, but what I'm saying is, a lot of people we used to do stories on, we talked to in the bush, they saw things like lions and elephants that uh, we would um, be well disposed to as a, a menace to their lives. Uh, and they're the ones who live there. What, what do you say to that? There will, <clears throat> there will always be uh, the balance between human growth, population, uh, farming and wildlife. Uh, and that's, that's a matter for governments and people in society to work their way through. That's not an area that I want to uh, start entering the debate on because that widens the scope. You know, people have said to me, uh, why don't I do something about how cows and pigs and sheep are slaughtered, uh, so on and so forth. But that's, a that's, that's something that is a different subject. And I, I never wish to be drawn uh, into these peripheral subjects. I just want to have the narrow focus on the captive bred line industry and its cruelty and just have the focus on that. All these other issues uh, people can deal with. I've said that there are some conservation arguments in genuine photo uh, uh, trophy hunting of different species. It doesn't mean I accept the argument, but there are arguments. But there is no argument as to why this narrow, uh, small amount uh, of cruelty should be allowed to continue. Okay, one other uh, issue has also been raised uh, in the times when we've uh, interviewed hunting organisations here. And funnily enough, in the newsroom, we were talking earlier about this interview, and one of my colleagues, within 35 seconds, people were talking about The Lion King, the film, etc., etc., is that sometimes maybe um, uh, we as humans, we've personified animals too much. And uh, we, we look at them as cute and cuddly. And as we both know, animals uh, are not like that, especially in the wild on this continent. Yes, I mean, you'll get all, you'll get, you'll get many views uh, on animals. Uh, uh, you will find people who will support the, the animal charities of all types of animals, whether they're dogs, they're cats whether they're beavers, whether they're this, that, this, that, and the other. And it's up to society and our politicians to find the balance uh, between the dominant species on this planet being us. 
um, and the other animals that share this planet with us. And there'll always be disagreement as to how far to go. There is disagreement on whether, Zim, uh, whether uh, Botswana should be culling elephants. There are arguments on both, uh, both sides and, uh, and high passions uh, on both sides. Uh, but though, though I have views on all these issues, they're not ones that I want to have confused with the captive bread line industry. And overall, again, I'll just go back slightly to the, uh, the authorities, what can be done about it. I'm sure the authorities in South Africa here can do a lot about it if they uh, were so moved. But uh, again, I, I point to the fact that um, this con country and this continent going through heavy, difficult times at the moment. COVID-19 has made it worse, but already the government coffers are empty. Uh, schools are growing out for money, roads, everything else. It's probably going to be the last thing. It's a very bad time to ask them to act on something they don't really, I don't think, will see as essential. There's always a bad time for anything in society to change. And that argument is invariably used uh, when people don't want something to change. It doesn't mean to say that pressure should not continue uh, to be applied. And COVID one day will we hope with a vaccine that whatever uh, may be something that passes. But meanwhile, uh, this particular industry needs people like Ian Mickler, like others in South Africa, uh, to be bringing it to the attention. And, uh, and perhaps one day we can get to a point uh, where we can stop tourists coming in to see these uh, petting of the lions, walking with the lions, Maybe we can get a, a ban by CITES on exports. Maybe we can get the lion uh, moved up to Appendix 1 from Appendix 2. There, there's always something uh, that can be done. Well, thank you very much indeed for your time and insights there. That was Lord Ashcroft joining me live from his adopted home in Belize in Central America. He's written a book about canned lion hunting here in Africa, uh, calling it Unfair Game. He has uh, also launched a campaign to try to stop the shooting of canned lions. And uh, no doubt we'll be taking this further and going to the authorities with it. Thank you very much indeed for your time. And I'm afraid that's all we've got time for on this edition of uh, In Conversation. From me, Chris Bishop, here at CNBC Africa, it's goodbye. <laughs>